Hi everybody, this is Bethany and today I'm going to be making a video about how to make spell balls. These balls are used to deliver spell effects in LARP games, um, specifically for the game that I play in locally here in Maryland called Darkon. Um, so without much further ado, let's get started. So first and foremost, you'll need some, some basic sewing supplies. You'll need some pins and needles. You'll need some threads. There is a pin from this decorative pin set that is the moon shape that I use quite a lot. You can get good fab decent fabric scissors for like $15, $16. Really makes a difference in cutting out accurate edges. Um, and you can also use these for cutting threads. Um, or you can just use a you know, a nice sharp pair of craft scissors. I, um, I tend to try to get a, a thread color that is not the same as my, um, as the color that I use for the, the spell balls themselves. Um, pin cushion or magnetic needle holder. Um, I really like this one. It, it costs anywhere between three and seven dollars depending on where you buy it. Dritz makes this one, but I like it because it just fastens around my wrist. You're gonna need some markers to mark your fabric. I prefer not to just use solid black, just so that if any of that line does show after I'm done sewing, um, it's it's as invisible as possible. Some kind of thimble. When you're sewing these spell balls, um, you're going to be using a rocking motion with the needle, and that puts a lot of pressure on the finger that you're using to push the needle. Um, which I, I was, I made one or two and then kind of by the time I got to the third one, I was like, wow, my finger's getting really sore. So what I ended up doing was just using some regular old electrical tape, folding it over two or three times on itself. And then I would put this on my finger, wrap it around once or twice, cut it. And then I had a nice little thimble that I could use, but then I found some, just some leather at a uh, craft supply store. I laid it over my finger, pinned it, stitched along the edge, turned it inside out, um, slipped it on over my finger, and then just wrapped a piece of electrical tape around it. And this little guy has been my best friend for sewing spell balls ever since. I use spray adhesive. Um, I prefer regular spray adhesive rather than repositionable adhesive um, because it holds long term. Um, but you do want to use this outside, preferably with gloves because if it gets on your fingers it's very, very sticky and hard to get off. You'll need a template for your fabrics. I'm going to um, scan these in and um, have a sheet available that people can print off. And then you're also going to need two different types of fabric. You'll need um, regular blizzard fleece. And what we're trying to do by lining our pieces of, of fabric with fleece is cushion each stitch so that they crease the stitch line less. You want to get as few of these little um, pull marks in your fabric as you can and lining the back of your fabric with fleece helps with that. My preferred fabrics are the ones that closely resemble um, t-shirt material and if you like to upcycle you can find both of these types of fabric usually at thrift stores. I've actually gone and bought a t-shirt and just cut it up from there. So you can go to a thrift store and just get the t-shirts and the colors that you need and maybe a fleece blanket and you'll be good to go. And you only need an eighth of a yard of each color to be able to make your spell balls. Maybe even less if you want to um, go horizontally with your with your patterns. All right, so those are all of our materials. Let's get into um, how we combine our fabrics and cut out our sections. 
Okay, so this is the section where we're going to talk about tracing and cutting out your um, your spell ball sections. Uh, the end result is going to look something like this, where you have um, individual pieces that have a layer of fleece and then a layer of your top fabric, um, a little edge around um, outside of your line, and um, two of each piece for each spell ball. So we will take our template and you'll lay out your fabric and some people like to be very economical with um, doing traces but the most important thing with these is you want to make sure you're leaving um, just a little bit of fabric around the edge of your design as you can We're going to go around and just gently trace your pattern. It does not have to be perfect. One of the reasons I like the t-shirt fabric is because it's very forgiving if your shapes are just a little bit off. Uh, but we're going to trace our first one. So here we go. We've got our our two traced out pieces. So I'm just going to lay this out, smooth it and then cut these out together. And now that we have this piece, we would go outside or on a protected ventilated surface and we're gonna use our, um, our Elmer's glue spray adhesive to spray the bottom piece of fabric. You don't wanna do this one because this one's a lot gonna be a lot more fiddly. Um, your fleece is a little bit less prone to moving around and being silly. So we can spray it. I'm not spraying it indoors, but you get the idea. Um, when you spray this stuff, if you need to use your can multiple times, after you do your spray, make sure you turn the can upside down and, sp and spray, press on the nozzle until the gas coming out of it runs clear. And that clears your tip so that when you go to use it the second time, you don't get globby, um, globby pieces of glue. So once this has glue on it, like I said, you want to use gloves if you can. Um, it's going to be tacky and you want to try to move as quickly as you can to put your top piece of fabric on. And uh, you're just going to lay it down over top, kind of line up one of your edges and then just drop it on. Easy peasy. And then you can take your hand and just kind of pat it down smooth it. A couple of wrinkles are okay. You want to get any of the big ones out and then just kind of press so that the glue adheres. Once that's done, you can start cutting this out right away. I like to start, even though there's glue on this piece, as long as you keep um, from cutting just on the gray layer, uh, you should be able to keep your scissors from getting gummed up. So first things first, I like to separate my pieces out. And this right here is about how much um, seam allowance we want to leave um, over the edge of our design um, for use with sewing later. So I'll just take my scissors and if you want to go with a marker and kind of draw out the line um, that you're actually going to cut, that's totally fine. Uh, whatever's easiest for you to follow with your scissors, but I'm just going to go around and kind of eyeball it. These will be sticky. Throw these away. <laughs> Once these are cut out, this is the step that, where I would um, paint on my little symbols. And it is much easier, to, having done it both ways, it is much easier to put your symbols on when the pieces are flat like this um, so that you can work on the table rather than having to try to produce a consistent result um, on a round surface. Um, for a spell ball that only is going to have one symbol on it, um, you'll only paint one of your pieces. So you'll have a painted piece and a plain piece. 
um, if you want your your spell ball to have two symbols on it, the piece that you paint your symbol on, you'll do the same symbol upside down on the other side um, so that when you turn your ball, you don't have a symbol here and a symbol here. You have one on opposite sides. The symbol is painted on the same piece so that there's one symbol on each side of the spell ball. Okay, so we're ready to start sewing our pieces. I have, you can see I have my little thimble on my finger there. Um, and we're gonna be using a ladder stitch um, to connect our two pieces together. Um, there are lots of helpful videos if you need to learn how to do the ladder stitch, and we'll definitely pick it up as we go. But the idea of the ladder stitch is that it allows you to combine two pieces of fabric that are right side out, meaning this is the side that you're gonna see so that the edge folds in and combines like this to produce a neat finished edge around the side of your spell ball. Again, I'm not gonna teach you how to do the ladder stitch per se, but I will kind of briefly explain how it works. Um, so we have our needle and thread. We're going to go, and these are our two pieces of fabric where they face each other. We're going to go up through the bottom of one piece of fabric and then our stitch is going to come over. We're going to pick up a little piece of fabric, go back over, pick up a little piece of fabric, go back over, pick up a little piece, and keep going. So it looks kind of like this across the edges of our fabric. So it kind of looks like the rungs of a ladder. And then what happens when we pull on this thread is that it does a little zipper effect and brings the edges together with the exposed edge underneath. And you can see that on the outside, this was an early one, so don't mind all of my puckers, but you can see this is the outside of our fabric. And then when you flip it over, those two edges meet very neatly in that line. But we want to avoid doing these puckers. This is why we don't why, why we use stretch fabric because this here is a woven fabric and it didn't have the stretch, so all those little puckers just had nowhere to go. Um, so these are the fundamentals of the ladder stitch. And we'll, if you don't know how to do it, you'll definitely pick it up as we go. And we are going to start by pinning our pieces to part of the spell ball. So I have my one piece. I'm going to put a little pin right there in the end. The colors of the pins don't mean anything. I'm gonna wrap it around, try to keep it as straight as I can, and pin that. Take my second piece, try to line it up with the curve of your first one. It doesn't have to be overlapping, that's not necessary. We're just gonna line it up so they touch a little bit. Put in the pin. And then I am, I am stretching it just a little bit, not too much. So that it comes around and touches the other side. And then I'm just going to kind of even this out a little bit. And then put a pin. So there's my, my two first pins. And then I'm just going to kind of go right across from that and pin that. Same with my first piece where it meets up kind of just a little bit so they're as close together as possible. And then I'm just going to pin right there. So that at least where the, t where the two pieces meet, top and bottom, um, I have a pin there kind of holding it in place. Then um, we, when I start my stitching for um, a, a piece that has a, an emblem on it, I try to avoid starting my stitch 
where you would see it on this side. So I'm going to start my pinning going around the opposite side. And I only like to pin one kind of stretch at a time because as you sew, it will distort the rest of the fabric and you're going to want to adjust it as you go. So we're just going to do one side at a time. So I've got that set up, they touch pretty well, and I'm ready to start sewing. And I'm going to choose a color of thread that is easy to see against the fabric. Um, I want to be able to see it while I'm sewing, and I want you guys to be able to see it too, so you can see how this looks. So I'm going to pull out maybe two arm's lengths of this fabric, or of this thread. And I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of hand sewing skills. When I first started making these spell balls, I felt really clumsy with the thread. So if you don't have a lot of um, sewing, hand sewing skills, you can still make these. It might just, you might just need one or two spell balls to kind of practice the ladder stitch. And then you'll get much cleaner at it once you get a little more practice. So I make my little end knot by just grabbing a little length, twisting two or three times reaching through, grab the end, and then we're just going to pull it and make a knot. A little knot there, I don't know if you can see it, it's a knot. Leave ourselves a little tail there. When I sew these spell balls, I like to sew from right to left. Blame it on the manga, um, which I read a lot of as a kid because I'm a nerd, but I have found that it is much easier to keep my thread from getting all twisted if I work in this direction, and you'll see why. So I'm coming not directly on my emblem face, and I am going to go up through my first side, pull that through, and then... Go directly opposite, go down into my fabric, not into the foam of the ball. You just want to dip down far enough to grab the outer piece and the inner piece like that. And then you're going to bring your needle right back up on the same side and pull your thread through. When your thread is really long early on, you'll spend a lot of time untwisting it. That's okay. And then we're going to go across, pick up a little piece of fabric, and make our stitch. And you want to try to keep your threads as even as possible while you're doing this. And you can see my first two little stitches are nice and even. But yeah, so here's the first two stitches that we did. You can see they're pretty parallel. And we don't need to pull the thread super tight while we're doing our sections of the ladder stitch. Um, I've, I like to leave it uh, a little bit more open like that just so I can kind of see where I've been. But we're going to keep on going with that stitch. Picking, going down in. And you can see what I'm doing here is I'm using this line as kind of my guide for where to put my stitches. So when I'm coming, I'm coming just on the inside of that line. Picking up that little bit of stitch there. Trying to keep my threads as untwisted and even as I can. And then going back. It's easy. When I first started my first um, 
instinct was to kind of make my stitch and then come behind. You see how the thread is coming this way and like I'm putting my needle there? Don't do that. Try to keep your needle, um, try to keep your thread over where you've already been because if you go in like this, it's gonna get your thread all twisted. So I'm picking up a little piece, keeping it nice and even, and you can see how they really do look like the rungs of a ladder. Coming back over. And basically we're gonna, um, I will pause to speed up the video here in a few minutes, um, but I wanna show you the first two kind of sections that I do at regular speed so you can see what it looks like when I pull my thread and bring and really bring the pieces together. I'm gonna do one more stitch and then show that to you. Keeping your stitches the same length takes a little bit of practice. If they're wonky at first, give yourself a break. And you can see how my my threads here are not super even. It can be hard to do the zipper if this happens. So take that extra second to pull your threads even as you go so that you, um, so that you don't have difficulty zippering it later. All right, so I've got a nice little section. Um, I would say no longer than the first section of your finger or an inch or so is as long as you want to go because um, if you keep going longer than that, it gets hard. I told you I was going to tell you what I use this little half moon pin for. And what I like to do before I start to zipper is to push the edges of my fabric under so that when I pull the fabric, they really kind of butt up next to each other nicely. So I'm just using, and you can use anything. You can use a piece, a pair of scissors. You can use a little like sculpting tool. Um, sometimes if I can't find my little half moon needle, I'll even just come in with the back of my sewing needle and push. But I'm just kind of tucking the edges of my fabric under. so that when I go to zipper my fabric, they're already kind of going down in the right direction. Okay, so I'm gonna just take my thread and just gently pull, and we're gonna see those two edges of fabric come together just like that. And if you keep pulling, you're gonna start to get those bunches. So if you if you notice bunches, you can just take your fingers and kind of stretch along the, the seam line and get your fabric laying nice and flat again. All right, so I'm gonna do another section at regular speed so you can see how that looks. And then we'll pause and, and, uh, and pick up the video a little bit so you can see what the end looks like. Alrighty, I'm just working my way around. Again, I've, at this point, I've probably made about 70 of these. Um, so I've had lots of practice with this stitch. It does take time. Um, it's, it's, it's an easy stitch to pick up. Um, but if uh, getting your stitches even is what can take a little bit of practice but the stitch itself is relatively straightforward again stopping to even out my threads so they're not twisted or bunched We're not sewing into the, the foam of the ball at all. We're just going down um, into the fleece layer. And I'll even use my thumbnail as kind of a, a, a push stop for the tip of my needle when I'm bringing it back up 
to kind of push up onto my nail and kind of help it get through a little bit. And this goes pretty quick. Like I said, when I first started sewing, um, it would take me about two hours to sew each ball. And now I've got it, typically got it down to about an hour. Um, and a lot of the times I'll sit and sew these while I'm watching TV or playing Dungeons and Dragons with my friends. Um, just as something to kind of keep my hands busy. But the first several that I made, I definitely needed um, to focus. Okay, so I've got a nice little line of stitches there. I'm going to take my little pin, push anything under, and even if it looks like they're fairly well seated, sometimes I'll go under and just kind of poke it up in there to make sure that the fabric is, instead of standing up like this, which is going to give you a really a distinct ridge here, kind of push it so that they fold under, and that will help your, your seam line to lay flat. A lot of little things to think about, but if you put them into practice with these, you get a really nice end result. I've gotten a lot of compliments on these. And I'm very clumsy. I've got thick fingers, so I'm always dropping things, but we can still sew a spell ball. Look at that. And you can see if I keep pulling that thread, it's going to bunch my fabric. So I'm just going to go back and kind of pull the fabric apart so that the seam lays nice and smooth. Um, if you notice that any of your stitch points get really peaky, you can also take this and go back and kind of poke it in there and work it into the, into the edge. And if you do that with your really peaky stitches, it'll help your um, your seam line to be less like wiggly. Okay, so we've got this here. And you can see that as I've been sewing, it's kind of starting to push my fabric in a weird direction. So I'm just going to pause, pull out a couple of pins, and lay that flat again. So that when I go to sew it... I'm not having to like deal with a bunch of fabric bunches while I'm sewing. That's why I don't go around the whole spell ball um, before I start sewing. And you can see here that we're coming up to a curve like this. These can be tricky because just like people who are racing on a racetrack, the stitches on this side should be a little bit bigger than the stitches on this side if it's going to sew evenly. And the way that you can do that to think about it, you want to keep them in proportion. I can show you by drawing it here. So I've got my little sewing edge here, my two pieces. You're going to want to think about it like like your fingers or like the rays of the sun or something like that where you want the stitches that are on the inside they still need to line up you still want one stitch to one stitch but the stitches on the inside as you're going around this curve here you want the stitches on the inside to be just a little bit smaller than the stitches on the outside so that when you pull your fabric, the stitches are still parallel to each other. Um, and you can see how these stitches are just a little smaller than the ones on the outside, kind of like how if I lay my hand down flat, on this side it's, near, it's thinner than on this side, which would be thicker. And if you keep that in mind while you sew around these curves, it, it's just a mess if you, if you don't keep them proportional by having smaller ones on the inside and lo slightly larger ones on the outside. So let me show you that before I speed up the video. And it really made a difference in making these spell balls neater. Because going around those, sorry, going around those corners um, was a little bit frustrating for me for a while. 
until I kind of figure that part out. So again, you can kind of see how far apart my stitches are on this side. And I'm just getting into the curve now. And I'm going to make a slightly smaller stitch on the inside. Just like racers on a racetrack or race cars, the one on the outside has farther to go than the one on the inside. Slightly larger stitch. Slightly smaller stitch. And it's a little difficult to see at this scale, but that is what I'm doing. Slightly larger stitch. Slightly smaller stitch. Slightly larger stitch. And untangle my thread here. The, uh, this, the synthetic knit fabrics really do mess with your thread. I much prefer the t-shirt fabric. All right. So with that method, we've managed to keep our stitches pretty even, even though we're going around a curve here, and that's good. I'm going to pull these tight, poke my little edges under. You can see here that, you know, I'm really kind of poking them under so that my where the seam comes together is gonna butt up against the other side instead of like having the edge of the fabric have to pull that. It's a lot easier to zipper when you poke it with your little with your little poker. Alrighty. I'm just going to pull, and you want to keep where you're pulling on the thread as close to the spell ball as possible. Don't pull from back here or you'll snap your thread. I'm going to pull until it starts to bunch, go back, unbunch it, look for any little peaky points that I want to flatten out a little bit. And there we go. And I like to keep um, pins at where my stitch starts, but all these other ones you can kind of pull out as you go, because you'll need them for when you go on the other side that we didn't pin yet. Pull those out, pull that one out. Okay, so I'm gonna keep sewing so you can see how it looks when I go around, um, but I think I'll speed up the video so it's a little bit uh, faster.
As your thread gets increasingly more twisted, which just happens as you continue pulling it through the fabric, you might want to come out and um, untwist your sewing thread by just splitting it and then coming all the way out down to your needle so that your your threads aren't twisted. They'll, they'll kind of twist up on their own as you continue working. Um, but that way you don't have to stop and untwist your, your threads as much as you go. Okay, so I'm just about to the halfway point here. I'm going to need to add pins to the rest of my sphere. And you can see that just from sewing half of the ball, the gaps in our, um, in our pieces have kind of gotten a little wider. Um, if this is a problem when you're pinning, you can come and kind of gently stretch the edges of your fabric so that it kind of uh, comes across and fills that gap. A word of caution though, um, as you stretch, you'll kind of hear it start to like make a little crackling sound sometimes. That means that the glue between the two pieces, between your inside and your outside, is actually separating we want to prevent that as much as possible so just try to be gentle if you have to stretch your edges so that you don't um, separate the glue between your fabric. It's okay if it does happen like you can still sew it down um, but it's more likely to get bunchy and weird and dealing with two separate pieces of fabric when you're doing your lab ladder stitch is a little bit harder to do than if you're just dealing with one, you know, uh, one piece. Okay, I'm back. Um, I did go ahead and sew a little bit more along the line just so that we, uh, really see what it looks like but we've got a nice seam edge not too much bunching it looks pretty nice and we are coming in on the home stretch working our way around this curve remembering to keep the uh, outside stitches a little longer than the inside stitches just to make things nice and even And then the closer you get to this thing actually being done, the more this looks like a weird mystique space. Well, anyway. Separate that in. And now we're, we're, right now we're within an inch or so of where we started. So this is where I'm gonna take a pin and go down in between the two layers of fabric and kind of pull the shaft of the pin as close to that starting stitch as I can. Because what we're gonna do is put that pin in there and that is going to save a little channel down between the fabric so that we can hide our finishing knot in there. And I'll show you what that looks like. If you find that as you're getting close to your end point that there's one side that's kind of gaped just a little bit, you'll just want to um, pick up a couple of larger stitches on the droopy side to kind of even out the fabric.
And even though I could go all the way up to here and zip this whole section, I'm going to try to leave that last little section for last so that I'm not um, pulling thread tension right up against that spot too much. Look, it's so cool. Man, I drop things constantly. Just flatten out a couple little peaky stitches there. Okay, so we've got our last little opening. And what we do as we bring these stitches closer and closer, I'm going to put my last two stitches almost right up against that starting one there. So that there's no gap. And this is really where having that line um, is so helpful because the fabric does get distorted sometimes and knowing where to put your needle is just such a huge help. My last little stitch is going right up next to that needle, maybe even just a little bit past it. So I know that there's no gap in my stitch line. I'm going to tuck my little edges. I think like a, a little sculpting tool would be good for this too. Okay, so my last little section zipping that closed look at that so awesome and if we didn't have this pin here this stitch line would close up and you would not be able to get a needle down into that like at all trust me i tried because what we're going to do is we're going to make a knot so just like we did at first i'm going to grab a little loop with my finger twist it three or four times pass my thread through and then just so that I can get it real close to where I want to put it through by the pin, I'll stick my needle in and use that to kind of help me tighten my knot. Because other, I really, like my hand sewing skills are not good and I suck at making knots. But that way, when I pull it out, I've got a pretty decent knot really close to where I want it to be. And sometimes if that knot feels small, like that's a little on the small side, I'll go back and just do like one kind of around it to make it just a little bigger. The blizzard, the, the fleece really helps to prevent knots from like pulling through the fabric. But I still want to have a decent sized knot there. Ah, look at that. Nice, respectable little knot there. And then I'm going to try to get this nice and close so you can see. What I'm going to do is like push my pin to one side so it creates an opening. Can you see that? And I'm going to take my needle and just follow it right down that pin underneath of the fabric you would not be able to do that without that pin there and I'm just gonna bring it so that it comes underneath the fabric and then out about maybe half an inch away and what that's gonna let us do it's like a magic trick I love it it's gonna let us pull our knot under the fabric so it's invisible look at that it's so perfect I love it every single time now if you had a little gap there you could take a little bit of super glue or something and just put just a tiny little dot and kind of push your edges together while it dried just tiny 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 because that does turn hard with glue but if with a little bit of practice and following that needle right down into that stitch 
you'll be able to get that knot underneath of there every single time. And then when you pull it out, you can just take your scissors, run it up that thread to where it meets the fabric. It's almost like you're just shaving it off. And then look at that. It is perfect. And if you can get your knot real close to the fabric, there's not a lot of space for the, for the seam to open, so it'll stay just like that. You won't see your tail. You've got a perfectly continuous spell ball. No bunches. Beautiful. Look at that. All right, so that's how I make spell balls. I've got a lot of them. Um, it takes me about um, an hour of prep time for a batch and an hour to sew. <coughs> sew each bowl. Um, so if you think about making these for yourselves or maybe having a, a country party where you all sit down and sew some of these, um, you have a really nice attractive spell bowl. And I will say that if you're making a lot of these of the same color, um, Please, please, please make sure that you're putting either a symbol or your initials somewhere on the ball um, so that they can make their way back to you uh, if you throw them on the field and someone else has to pick them up. So do your spell marshals a favor by marking your spell balls so that they can find their way back to you. Alrighty, well this has been um, how I make how I sew a baseball size style um, spell ball. I hope you find this informative. I'm gonna have a, um, a, a digital scan of my uh, templates available for you guys to use if you wanna start sewing these. And I'll also make a link available to the Amazon, sh uh, to the place on Amazon where I purchase uh, both sizes of spell balls. Uh, so that way you guys can get your hands on some material and give it a try, make yourself some some nifty spell balls. Cool. Thanks.